Introduction of Best Russian Short Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Best Russian Short Stories Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer Introduction by Thomas Seltzer Conceive the joy of a lover of nature who, leaving the art galleries, wanders out among the trees and wild flowers and birds that the pictures of the galleries have sentimentalized. It is some such joy that the man who truly loves the noblest in letters feels when tasting for the first time the simple delights of Russian literature. French and English and German authors, too, occasionally offer works of lofty, simple naturalness but the very keynote to the whole of russian literature is simplicity naturalness voraciousness another essentially russian trait is the quite unaffected conception that the lowly are on a plane of equality with the so-called upper classes when the englishman dickens wrote with his profound pity and understanding of the poor there was yet a bit of remoteness perhaps even a bit of character in his treatment of them. He showed their sufferings to the rest of the world, with a, Behold how the other half lives. The Russian writes of the poor, as it were, from within, as one of them, with no eye to theatrical effect upon the well-to-do. There is no insistence upon peculiar virtues or vices. The poor are portrayed just as they are, as human beings like the rest of us. A democratic spirit is reflected, breathing a broad humanity, a true universality, an unstudied generosity that proceed not from the intellectual conviction that to understand all is to forgive all, but from an instinctive feeling that no man has the right to set himself up as a judge over another, that one can only observe and record. In 1834 two short stories appeared the queen of spades by pushkin and the cloak by gogol the first was a finishing off of the old outgoing style of romanticism the other was the beginning of a new and characteristically russian style we read pushkin's queen of spades the first story in the volume and the likelihood is we shall enjoy it greatly but why is it russian we ask the answer is it is not russian it might have been printed in an American magazine over the name of John Brown. But now take the very next story in the volume, The Cloak. Ah, you exclaim, a genuine Russian story. Surely you cannot palm it off on me over the name of Jones or Smith. Why? Because The Cloak for the first time strikes that truly Russian note of deep sympathy with the disinherited it is not yet wholly free from artificiality and so it is not yet typical of the purely realistic fiction that reached its perfected development in turgenev and tolstoy though pushkin heads the list of those writers who made the literature of their country world famous he was still a romanticist in the universal literary fashion of his day however he already gave strong indication of the peculiarly russian genius for naturalness or realism and was a true russian in his simplicity of style in no sense an innovator but taking the cue for his poetry from byron and for his prose from the romanticism current of that period he was not in advance of his age he had a revolutionary streak in his nature and his ode to liberty and other bits of verse and his intimacy with the decemberist rebels shows but his youthful fire soon dies down and he has found it possible to accommodate himself to the life of a russian high functionary and courtier under the severe despot nicholas i though to be sure he always hated that life for all his flirting with revolutionarism he never displayed great originality or depth of thought he was simply an extraordinarily gifted author a perfect versifier a wondrous lyrist and a delicious raconteur endowed with a grace ease of power of expression that delighted even the exacting artistic sense of turgenev 
To him aptly applies the dictum of Socrates. Not by wisdom do the poets write poetry, but by a sort of genius and inspiration. I do not mean to convey that as a thinker Pushkin is to be despised. Nevertheless, it is true that he would occupy a lower position in literature did his reputation depend upon his contributions to thought and not upon his value as an artist. We are all descended from Gogol's cloak, said a Russian writer, and Dostoevsky's novel, Poor People, which appeared ten years later, is in a way merely an extension of Gogol's shorter tale. In Dostoevsky, indeed, the passion for the common people and the all-embracing, all-penetrating pity for suffering humanity reached their climax. He was a profound psychologist and delved deeply into the human soul, especially in its abnormal and diseased aspects. Between scenes of heart-rending abject poverty, injustice and wrong, and the torments of mental pathology, he managed almost to exhaust the whole range of human woe, and he analyzed this misery with an intensity of feeling and a painstaking regard for the most harrowing details that are quite upsetting to normally constituted nerves. Yet all the horrors must be forgiven him because of the motive inspiring them, an overpowering love and the desire to induce an equal love in others. It is not horror for horror's sake, not a literary tour de force as in Poe, but horror for a high purpose, for purification through suffering, which was one of the articles of Dostoevsky's faith. Following as a corollary from the love and pity for mankind that made a leading element in Russian literature is the passionate search for the means of improving the lot of humanity, a fervent attachment to social ideas and ideals. A Russian author is more ardently devoted to a cause than an American short story writer to a plot. This, in turn, is but a reflection of the spirit of the Russian people, especially of the intellectuals. The Russians take literature perhaps more seriously than any other nation. To them, books are not a mere diversion. They demand that fiction and poetry be a true mirror of life and be of service to life. A Russian author, to achieve the highest recognition, must be a thinker also. He need not necessarily be a finished artist. Everything is subordinated to two main requirements, humanitarian ideals and fidelity to life. This is the secret of the marvelous simplicity of Russian literary art. Before the supreme function of literature, the Russian writer stands awed and humbled. He knows he cannot cover up poverty of thought, poverty of spirit, and lack of sincerity by rhetorical tricks or verbal cleverness. And if he possesses the two essential requirements, the simplest language will suffice. These qualities are exemplified at their best by Turgenev and Tolstoy. They both had a strong social consciousness. They both grappled with the problems of human welfare. They were both artists in the larger sense, that is, in their truthful representation of life. Turgenev was an artist also in the narrower sense in a keen appreciation of form. Thoroughly occidental in his tastes, he sought the regeneration of Russia and radical progress along the lines of European democracy. Tolstoy, on the other hand, sought the salvation of mankind in a return to the primitive life and primitive Christian religion. The very first work of importance by Turgenev, A Sportsman's Sketches, dealt with the question of serfdom and it wielded tremendous influence in bringing about its abolition. Almost every succeeding book of his, from Rudin through Fathers and Sons to Virgin Soil, presented vivid pictures of contemporary Russian society with its problems, the clash of ideas between the old and the new generations, and the struggles, the aspirations, and the thoughts that engrossed the advanced youth of Russia so that his collected works form a remarkable literary record of the successive movements of Russian society in a period of preparation fraught with epochal significance, which culminated in the overthrow of Tsarism and the inauguration of a new and true democracy, marking the beginning, perhaps, 
of a radical transformation the world over. The greatest writer of Russia, that is Turgenev's estimate of Tolstoy, a second Shakespeare, was Flaubert's enthusiastic outburst. The Frenchman's comparison is not wholly illuminating. The one point of resemblance between the two authors is simply in the tremendous magnitude of their genius. Each is a colossus. Each creates a whole world of characters, from kings and princes and ladies to servants and maids and peasants. And how vastly divergent the angle of approach! Anna Karenina may have all the subtle womanly charm of an Olivia or a Portia, but how different her trials! Shakespeare could not have treated Anna's problems at all. Anna could not have appeared in his pages except as a sinning Gertrude, the mother of Hamlet. Shakespeare had all the prejudices of his age. He accepted the world as it is with its absurd moralities and conventions and institutions and social classes. A grave digger is naturally inferior to a lord, and if he is to be presented at all, he must come on as a clown. The people are always a mob, the rabble. Tolstoy is the revolutionist, the iconoclast. He has the completest independence of mind. He utterly refuses to accept established opinions just because they are established. He probes into the right and wrong of things. His is a broad, generous, universal democracy. His is a comprehensive sympathy. His an absolute incapacity to evaluate human beings according to station, rank, or profession, or any standard but that of spiritual worth. In all this, he was a complete contrast to Shakespeare. Each of the two men was like a creature of a higher world, possessed of supernatural endowments. Their omniscience of all things human, their insight into the hiddenmost springs of men's actions appears miraculous. But Shakespeare makes the impression of detachment from his works. The works do not reveal the man, while in Tolstoy the greatness of the man blends with the greatness of the genius. Tolstoy was no mere oracle uttering profundities he wot not of. As the social, religious, and moral tracts that he wrote in the latter period of his life are instinct with a literary beauty of which he never could divest himself, and which gave an artistic value even to his sermons, so his earlier novels show a profound concern for the welfare of society, a broad humanitarian spirit, a bigness of soul that included prince and pauper alike. Is this extravagant praise? Then let me echo William Dean Howells. I know very well that I do not speak of Tolstoy's books in measured terms. I cannot. The Russian writers so far considered have made valuable contributions to the short story, but with the exception of Pushkin, whose reputation rests chiefly upon his poetry, their best work generally was in the field of the long novel. It was the novel that gave Russian literature its preeminence. It could not have been otherwise, since Russia is young as a literary nation and did not come of age until the period at which the novel was almost the only form of literature that counted. If, therefore, Russia was to gain distinction in the world of letters, it could be only through the novel. Of the measure of her success, there is perhaps no better testimony than the words of Matthew Arnold, a critic certainly not given to overstatement. The Russian novel, he wrote in 1887, has now the vogue and deserves to have it. The Russian novelist is master of a spell to which the secret of human nature, both what is external and internal, gesture and manner no less than thought and feeling, willingly make themselves known. In that form of imaginative literature, which in our day is the most popular and the most possible, the Russians at the present moment seem to hold the field. With the strict censorship imposed on Russian writers, many of them who might perhaps have contented themselves with expressing their opinions in essays were driven to conceal their meaning under the guise of satire or allegory, which gave rise to a peculiar genre of literature, a sort of editorial or essay done into fiction, in which the satirist Saltykov, a contemporary of Turgenev and Dostoevsky, who wrote under the pseudonym Schneden, achieved the greatest success and popularity. 
it was not however until the concluding quarter of the last century that writers like korolenko and garshin arose who devoted themselves chiefly to the cultivation of the short story with anton chekhov the short story assumed a position of importance alongside the larger works of the great russian masters gorky and andreyev made the short story do the same for the service of the active revolutionary period in the last decade of the nineteenth century down to its temporary defeat in nineteen o six that turgenev rendered in his series of larger novels for the period of preparation but very different was the voice of gorky the man sprung from the people the embodiment of all the accumulated wrath and indignation of centuries of social wrong and oppression from the gentlemanly tones of the cultured artist turgenev like a mighty hammer his blows fell upon the decaying fabric of the old society his was no longer a feeble despairing protest with the strength and confidence of victory he made onslaught upon onslaught on the old institutions until they shook and almost tumbled and when reaction celebrated its short-lived triumph and gloom settled again upon his country and most of his co-fighters withdrew from the battle in despair some returning to the old-time russian mood of hopelessness passivity and apathy and some even backsliding into wild orgies of literary debauchery gorky never wavered never lost his faith and hope never for a moment was untrue to his principles now with the revolution victorious he has come into his right one of the most respected beloved and picturesque figures in the russian democracy kuprin the most facile and talented short writer next to chekhov has on the whole kept well to the best literary traditions of russia though he has frequently wandered off to extravagant sex themes for which he seems to display as great a fondness as artsy bashev simyonov is a unique character in russian literature a peasant who had scarcely mastered the most elementary mechanics of writing when he penned his first story but that story pleased tolstoy who befriended and encouraged him his tales deal altogether with peasant life in country and city and have a life-likeness an artlessness a simplicity striking even in a russian author there is a small group of writers detached from the main current of russian literature who worship at the shrine of beauty and mysticism of these sologob has attained the highest reputation rich as russia has become in the short story anton chekhov still stands out as the supreme master one of the greatest short story writers of the world he was born in taganarik in the ukraine in eighteen sixty the son of a peasant serf who succeeded in buying his freedom anton chekhov studied medicine but devoted himself largely to writing in which he acknowledged his scientific training was of great service though he lived only forty-four years dying of tuberculosis in nineteen o four his collected works consist of sixteen fair-sized volumes of short stories and several dramas besides a few volumes of his works have already appeared in english translation critics among them tolstoy have often compared chekhov to maupassant i find it hard to discover the resemblance maupassant holds a supreme position as a short story writer so does chekhov but there it seems to me the likeness ends the chill wind that blows from the atmosphere created by the frenchman's objective artistry is by the russian commingled with the warm breath of a great human sympathy maupassant never tells where his sympathies lie and you don't know you only guess chekhov does not tell you where his sympathies lie either but you know all the same you don't have to guess and yet chekhov is as objective as maupassant in the chronicling of facts conditions and situations in the reproduction of characters he is scrupulously true hard and inexorable but without obtruding his personality he somehow manages to let you know that he is always present always at hand if you laugh he is there to laugh with you if you cry he is there to shed a tear with you if you are horrified he is horrified too it is a subtle art by which he contrives to make one feel the nearness of himself for all his objectiveness 
so subtle that it defies analysis, and yet it constitutes one of the great charms of his tales. Chekhov's works show an astounding resourcefulness and versatility. There is no monotony, no repetition, neither in incident nor in character are any two stories alike. The range of Chekhov's knowledge of men and things seems to be unlimited, and he is extravagant in the use of it. Some great idea which many a writer would consider sufficient to expand into a whole novel he disposes of in a story of a few pages. Take, for example, Vanka, apparently but a mere episode in the childhood of a nine-year-old boy, while it is really the tragedy of a whole life in its tempting glimpses into a past environment and ominous forebodings of the future, all contracted into the space of four or five pages. Chekhov is lavish with his inventiveness. Apparently it cost him no effort to invent. I have used the word inventiveness for lack of a better name. It expresses but lamely the peculiar faculty that distinguishes Chekhov. Chekhov does not really invent, he reveals. He reveals things that no author before him has revealed. It is as though he possessed a special organ which enabled him to see, hear, and feel things of which we other mortals did not even dream the existence. Yet when he lays them bare we know that they are not fictitious, not invented, but as real as the ordinary familiar facts of life. This faculty of his playing on all conceivable objects, all conceivable emotions, no matter how microscopic, endows them with life and a soul. By virtue of this power, the steppe, an uneventful record of peasants traveling day after day through flat, monotonous fields, becomes instinct with dramatic interest, and its 125 pages seems all too short and by the virtue of the same attribute we follow with breathless suspense the minute description of the declining days of a great scientist who feels his physical and mental faculties gradually ebbing away. A tiresome story, Chekhov calls it, and so it would be without the vitality conjured into it by the magic touch of this strange genius. Divination is perhaps a better term than invention. Chekhov divines the most secret impulses of the soul, sends out what is buried in the subconscious and brings it up to the surface. Most writers are specialists. They know certain strata of society, and when they venture beyond, their step becomes uncertain. Chekhov's material is only delimited by humanity. He is equally at home everywhere. The peasant, the laborer, the merchant, the priest, the professional man, the scholar, the military officer, and the government functionary, Gentile or Jew, man, woman, or child, Chekhov is intimate with all of them. His characters are sharply defined individuals, not types. In almost all his stories, however short, the men and women and children who play a part in them come out as clear, distinct personalities. Ariadne is as vivid a character as Lily, the heroine of Suderman's Song of Songs, Yet Ariadne is but a single story in a volume of stories. Who that has read The Darling can ever forget her, the woman who had no separate existence of her own, but thought the thoughts, felt the feelings, and spoke the words of the men she loved. And when there was no man to love any more, she was utterly crushed until she found a child to take care of and to love. And then she sank her personality in the boy as she had sunk it before in her husband's and lover, become a mere reflection of him, and was happy again. In the compilation of this volume, I have been guided by the desire to give the largest possible representation to the prominent authors of the Russian short story, and to present specimens characteristic of each. At the same time, the element of interest has been kept in mind, and in a few instances, as in the case of Korolenko, the selection of the story was made with a view to its intrinsic merit and striking qualities, rather than as typifying the writer's art. It was, of course, impossible in the space of one book to exhaust all that is best, but to my knowledge the present volume is the most comprehensive anthology of the Russian short story in the English language, and gives a fair notion of the achievement in that field. All who enjoy good reading, I have no reason to doubt, will get pleasure from it, 
and if in addition it will prove an assistance to american students of russian literature i shall feel that the task has been doubly worth the while everything is subordinated to two main requirements humanitarian ideals and fidelity to life this is the secret of the marvelous simplicity of russian literary art thomas seltzer end of introduction by thomas seltzer Chapter 1 of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Of Best Russian Short Stories. Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin. 1. There was a card party at the rooms of Naramov of the Horse Guards. The long winter night passed away imperceptibly it was five o'clock in the morning before the company sat down to supper those who had won ate with a good appetite the others sat staring absently at their empty plates when the champagne appeared however the conversation became more animated and all took part in it and how did you fare sir and asked the host oh i lost as usual i must confess that i am unlucky i play merindole i always keep cool i never allow anything to put me out and yet i always lose and you did not once allow yourself to be tempted to back the red your firmness astonishes me but what do you think of herman said one of the guests pointing to a young engineer he has never had a card in his hand in his life he has never in his life laid a wager and yet he sits here till five o'clock in the morning watching our play play interests me very much said herman but i am not in the position to sacrifice the necessary in the hope of winning the superfluous herman is a german he's economical that is all observed tomsky but if there's one person that i can't understand it is my grandmother the countess anna fedotovna how so inquired the guests I cannot understand, continued Tomsky, how it is that my grandmother does not punt. What is there remarkable about an old lady of eighty not punting? said Naramov. Then you do not know the reason why? No, really, haven't the faintest idea. About sixty years ago my grandmother went to Paris, where she created quite a sensation. People used to run after her to catch a glimpse of the Muscovite Venus. Richelieu made love to her, and my grandmother maintains that he almost blew out his brains in consequence of her cruelty. At that time ladies used to play faro on one occasion at the court she lost a very considerable sum to the duke of orleans on returning home my grandmother removed the patches from her face took off her hoops informed my grandfather of her loss at the gaming table and ordered him to pay the money my deceased grandfather as far as i remember was a sort of house steward to my grandmother he dreaded her like fire but on hearing of such a heavy loss he almost went out of his mind he calculated the various sums she had lost and pointed out to her that in six months she had spent half a million francs that neither their moscow nor saratov estates were in paris and finally refused point-blank to pay the debt my grandmother gave him a box on the ear and slept by herself as a sign of her displeasure the next day she sent for her husband hoping that this domestic punishment had produced an effect upon him but she found him inflexible for the first time in her life she entered into reasonings and explanations with him thinking to be able to convince him by pointing out to him that there are debts and debts and that there is a great difference between a prince and a coachmaker but it was all in vain my grandfather still remained obdurate but the matter did not rest there my grandmother didn't know what to do she had shortly before become acquainted with a very remarkable man you have heard of count st germain about whom so many marvellous stories are told you know that he represented himself as the wandering jew as the discoverer of the elixir of life of the philosopher's stone and so forth some laughed at him as a charlatan but casanova in his memoirs says that he was a spy but be that as it may st germain in spite of the mystery surrounding him was a very fascinating person and was much sought after in the best circles of society even to this day my grandmother retains an affectionate recollection of him and becomes quite angry if any one speaks disrespectfully of him my grandfather knew that st germain had large sums of money at his disposal she resolved to have recourse to him and she wrote a letter to him asking him to come to her without delay the queer old man immediately waited upon her and found her overwhelmed with grief she described to him in the blackest colors the barbarity of her husband and ended by declaring that her whole hope depended upon his friendship and amiability st germain reflected i could advance you the sum you want said he but i know that you would not rest easy until you had paid me back and i should not like to bring fresh troubles upon you but there is another way of getting out of your difficulty you can win back your money but my dear count replied my grandmother i tell you that i haven't any money left money is not necessary replied st germain be pleased to listen to me 
then he revealed to her a secret for which each of us would give a good deal the young officers listened with increased attention tomsky lit his pipe puffed away for a moment and then continued that same evening my grandmother went to versailles to the jeu de la reine the duke of orleans kept the bank my grandmother excused herself in an off-hand manner for not having yet paid her debt by inventing some little story and then began to play against him she chose three cards and played them one after the other all three won sonica set of a card when it wins or loses in the quickest possible time and my grandmother recovered every farthing that she had lost mere chance said one of the guests a tale observed herbin perhaps they were marked cards said a third i don't think so replied tomsky gravely what said naramov you have a grandmother who knows how to hit upon three lucky cards in succession and you have never yet succeeded in getting the secret of it out of her that's the deuce of it all replied tomsky she had four sons one of whom was my father all four were determined gamblers and yet not to one of them did she ever reveal her secret although it would not have been a bad thing either for them or for me but this is what i've heard from my uncle count ivan ilyich and he assured me on his honour that it was true the late chaplitsky the same who died in poverty after having squandered millions once lost in his youth about three hundred thousand roubles to zorik if i remember rightly he was in despair my grandmother who was always very severe upon the extravagance of young men took pity however upon chaplitsky she gave him three cards telling him to play them one after another at the same time exacting from him a solemn promise that he would never play at cards again as long as he lived chaplitsky then went to his victorious opponent and then began a fresh game on the first card he staked fifty thousand roubles in one sonica he doubled the stake and won again till at last by pursuing the same tactics he won back more than he had lost but it's time to go to bed it's a quarter of six already and indeed it was already beginning to dawn the young men emptied their glasses and then took leave of each other too the old countess a was seated in her dressing-room in front of her looking-glass three waiting-maids stood around her one held a small pot of rouge another a box of hairpins and the third a tall can with bright red ribbons the countess had no longer the slightest pretensions to beauty but she still preserved the habits of her youth dressed in strict accordance with the fashion of seventy years before and made as long and as careful a toilette as she would have done sixty years previously near the window at her embroidery frame sat a young lady a ward good morning grandmamma said a young officer entering the room bonjour mademoiselle lise grandmamma i want to ask you something what is it paul i want you to let me introduce one of my friends to you and to allow me to bring him to the ball on friday bring him directly to the ball and introduce him to me there were you at b s yesterday yes everything went off very pleasantly and dancing was kept up until five o'clock how charming yeletskaya was but my dear what is there charming about her isn't she like a grandmother the princess daria petrovna by the way she must be very old the princess daria petrovna how do you mean old cried tomsky thoughtlessly she died seven years ago the young lady raised her head and made a sign to the young officer he then remembered that the old countess was never to be informed of the death of any of her contemporaries and he bit his lips the old countess heard the news with the greatest indifference dead said she i, I didn't know it we were appointed maids of honour at the same time and we were presented to the empress and the countess for the hundredth time related to her grandson one of her anecdotes come paul said she when she had finished her story help me to get up lizanka where's my snuff-box and the countess with her three maids went behind a screen to finish her toilette tomsky was left alone with the young lady who is the gentleman you wish to introduce to the countess asked lizaveta ivanovna in a whisper naramov do you know him no is he a soldier or a civilian a soldier is he in the engineers no in the cavalry what made you think he was in the engineers the young lady smiled but made no reply paul cried the countess from behind the screen send me some new novel only pray don't let it be one of the present-day style what do you mean grandmother that is a novel in which the hero strangles neither his father nor his mother and in which there are no drowned bodies i have a great horror of drowned persons there are no such novels nowadays would you like a russian one are there any russian novels send me one dear pray send me one good-bye grandmother i'm in a hurry good-bye lizaveta ivanovna what made you think that naramov was in the engineers and tomsky left the boudoir lizaveta ivanovna was left alone she laid aside her work and began to look out the window a few moments afterwards at a corner house on the other side of the street a young officer appeared a deep blush covered her cheeks she took up her work again and bent her head down over the frame at the same moment the countess returned completely dressed order the carriage lizaveta said she we will go out for a drive lizaveta arose from the frame and began to arrange her work what is the matter with you my child are you deaf cried the countess order the carriage to get ready at once i will do so this moment replied the young lady hastening into the ante-room a servant entered and gave the countess some books from prince paul alexandrovitch 
tell him that i am much obliged to him said the countess lizaveta lizaveta where are you running to i am going to dress there's plenty of time my dear sit down here open the first volume and read to me aloud her companion took the book and read a few lines louder said the countess what's the matter with you my child have you lost your voice wait give me that footstool a little nearer that will do lizaveta read two more pages the countess yawned put the book down said she what a lot of nonsense send it back to prince paul with my thanks but where's the carriage the carriage is ready said lizaveta looking out into the street how is it that you're not dressed said the countess i must always wait for you it's intolerable my dear liza hastened to her room she had not been there two minutes before the countess began to ring with all her might the three waiting-maids came running in at one door and the valet at another how is it that you cannot hear me when i ring for you said the countess tell lizaveta ivanovna that i am waiting for her lizaveta returned with her hat and cloak on at last you're here said the countess but why such an elaborate toilette whom do you intend to captivate what sort of weather is it it seems rather windy no your ladyship it's very calm replied the valet you never think of what you're talking about open the window so it is windy and bitterly cold unharness the horse lizaveta we won't go out there was no need for you to deck yourself like that what a life is mine thought lizaveta ivanovna and in truth lizaveta ivanovna was a very unfortunate creature the bread of the stranger is bitter said dante and a staircase hard to climb but who can know what the bitterness of dependence is so well as the poor companion of an old lady of quality the countess a had by no means a bad heart but she was capricious like a woman who had been spoilt by the world as well as being avaricious and egotistical like all old people who have seen their best days and whose thoughts are with the past and not on the present she participated in all the vanities of the great world went to balls where she sat in a corner painted and dressed in old-fashioned style like a deformed but indispensable ornament of the ballroom all the guests on entering approached her and made a profound bow as if in accordance with a set ceremony but after that nobody took any further notice of her she received the whole town at her house and observed the strictest etiquette although she could no longer recognize the faces of people her numerous domestics growing fat and old in her antechamber and in servants hall did just as they liked and vied with each other in robbing the aged countess in the most barefaced manner lizaveta ivanovna was the martyr of the household she made tea and was reproached with using too much sugar she read novels aloud to the countess and the faults of the author were visited upon her head she accompanied the countess in her walks and was answerable for the weather or the state of the pavement a salary was attached to her post but she very rarely received it although she was expected to dress like every one else that is to say like very few indeed in the society she played the most pitiable role everybody knew her and nobody paid attention to her at balls she danced only when a partner was wanted and ladies would only take hold of her arm when it was necessary to lead her out of the room to attend to their dresses she was very self-conscious and felt her position keenly and she looked about her with impatience for a deliverer to come to her rescue but the young men calculating in their giddiness honored her with but very little attention although lizaveta ivanovna was a hundred times prettier than the bare-faced and cold-hearted marriageable girls around whom they hovered many a time did she quietly slink away from the glittering but wearisome drawing-room to go and cry in her own poor little room in which stood a screen a chest of drawers a looking-glass and a painted bedstead and where a tallow candle burnt feebly in a copper candlestick one morning this was about two days after the evening party described at the beginning of this story and a week previous to the scene at which we have just assisted lizaveta ivanovna was seated near the window at her embroidery frame when happening to look out into the street she caught sight of a young engineer officer standing motionless with his eyes fixed upon her window she lowered her head and went on again with her work about five minutes afterwards she looked out again the young officer was still standing in the same place not being in the habit of coquetting with passing officers she did not continue to gaze out into the street but went on sewing for a couple of hours without raising her head dinner was announced she rose up and began to put her embroidery away but glancing casually out the window she perceived the officer again after dinner she went to the window with a certain feeling of uneasiness but the officer was no longer there and she thought no more about him a couple of days afterwards just as she was stepping into the carriage with the countess she saw him again he was standing close behind the door with his face half concealed by his fur collar but his dark eyes sparkled beneath his cap lizaveta felt alarmed though she knew not why and she trembled as she seated herself in the carriage on returning home she hastened to the window the officer was standing in his accustomed place with his eyes fixed upon her she drew back a prey to curiosity and agitated by a feeling which was quite new to her from that time forward not a day passed without the young officer making his appearance under the window at the customary hour and between him and her there was established a sort of mute acquaintance sitting in her place at work she used to feel his approach and raising her head she would look at him longer and longer each day the young man seemed to be very grateful to her she saw with the sharp eye of youth how a sudden flush covered his pale cheeks each time their glances met 
after about a week she commenced to smile at him when tomsky asked permission of his grandmother the countess to present one of his friends to her the young girl's heart beat violently but hearing that narumov was not an engineer she regretted that by her thoughtless question she had betrayed her secret to the volatile tomsky herman was the son of a german who had become a naturalized russian and from whom he had inherited a small capital being firmly convinced of the necessity of preserving his independence herman did not touch his private income but lived on his pay without allowing himself the slightest luxury moreover he was reserved and ambitious and his companions really had an opportunity of making merry at the expense of his extreme parsimony he had strong passions and an ardent imagination but his firmness of disposition preserved him from the ordinary errors of young men thus though a gamester at heart he never touched a card for he considered his position did not allow him as he said to risk the necessary in hope of winning the superfluous yet he would sit for nights together at the card table and follow with feverish anxiety the different turns of the game the story of the three cards had produced a powerful impression upon his imagination and all night long he could think of nothing else if he thought to himself the following evening as he walked along the streets of st petersburg if the old countess would but reveal her secret to me if she would only tell me the names of the three winning cards why should i not try my fortune i must get introduced to her and win her favor become her lover but all that will take time and she's eighty-seven years old she might be dead in a week in a couple of days even but the story itself can it really be true no economy temperance and industry those are my three winning cards by means of them i shall be able to double my capital increase it sevenfold and procure myself ease and independence musing in this manner he walked on until he found himself in one of the principal streets of st petersburg in front of a house of antiquated architecture the street was blocked with equipages carriages one after the other drew up in front of the brilliantly illuminated doorway at one moment there stepped out on to the pavement the well-shaped little foot of some young beauty at another the heavy boot of a cavalry officer and then the silk stockings and shoes of a member of the diplomatic world furs and cloaks passed in rapid succession before the gigantic porter at the entrance herman stopped whose house is this he asked the watchman at the corner the countess a's replied the watchman herman started the strange story of the three cards again presented itself to his imagination he began walking up and down before the house thinking of its owner and her strange secret returning late to his modest lodging he could not go to sleep for a long time and when at last he did doze off he could dream of nothing but cards green tables piles of banknotes and heaps of ducats he played one card after another winning in uninterruptedly and then he gathered up the gold and filled his pockets with the notes when he woke up late the next morning he sighed over the loss of his imaginary wealth and then sallying out into the town he found himself once more in front of the countess's residence some unknown power seemed to have attracted him thither he stopped and looked up at the windows at one of these he saw a head with luxuriant black hair which was bent down probably over some book or an embroidery frame the head was raised herman saw a fresh complexion and a pair of dark eyes that moment decided his fate Three lizaveta ivanovna had scarcely taken off her hat and cloak when the countess sent for her and again ordered her to get the carriage ready the vehicle drew up before the door and they prepared to take their seats just at that moment when two footmen were assisting the old lady to enter the carriage lizaveta saw her engineer standing close beside the wheel he grasped her hand alarm caused her to lose her presence of mind and the young man disappeared but not before he had left a letter between her fingers she concealed it in her glove and during the whole of the drive she neither saw nor heard anything it was the custom of the countess when out for an airing in her carriage to be constantly asking such questions as who was that person that met us just now what is the name of this bridge what is written on that signboard on this occasion however lizaveta returned such vague and absurd answers that the countess became angry with her what is the matter with you my dear she exclaimed have you taken leave of your senses or what is it do you not hear me or understand what i say heaven be thanked i am still in my right mind and speak plainly enough lizaveta ivanovna did not hear her. on returning home she ran to her room and drew the letter out of her glove it was not sealed lizaveta read it the letter contained a declaration of love it was tender respectful and copied word for word from a german novel but lizaveta did not know anything of the german language and she was quite delighted for all that the letter caused her to feel exceedingly uneasy for the first time in her life she was entering into secret and confidential relations with a young man his boldness alarmed her she reproached herself for her imprudent behavior and knew not what to do should she cease to sit at the window and by assuming an appearance of indifference towards him put a check upon the young officer's desire for further acquaintance with her should she send his letter back to him or should she answer him in a cold and decided manner there was nobody to whom 
she could turn in, in her perplexity for she had neither female friend nor adviser at length she resolved to reply to him she sat down at her little writing-table took pen and paper and began to think several times she began her letter and then tore it up the way she had expressed herself seemed to be either too inviting or too cold and decisive at last she succeeded in writing a few lines with which she felt satisfied i am convinced she wrote that your intentions are honourable and that you do not wish to offend me by any imprudent behaviour but our acquaintance must not begin in such a manner i return you your letter and i hope that i shall never have any cause to complain of this undeserved slight the next day as soon as herman made his appearance lizaveta rose from her embroidery went into the drawing-room opened the ventilator and threw the letter into the street trusting that the young officer would have the perception to pick it up herman hasted forward picked it up and then repaired to a confectioner's shop breaking the seal of the envelope he found inside it his own letter and lizaveta's reply he had expected this and he returned home his mind deeply occupied with its intrigue three days afterwards a bright-eyed young girl from a milliner's establishment brought lizaveta a letter lizaveta opened it with great uneasiness fearing that it was a demand for money when suddenly she recognized herman's handwriting you've made a mistake my dear said she this letter's not for me oh yes it's for you replied the girl smiling very knowingly have the goodness to read it lizaveta glanced at the letter herman requested an interview it cannot be she cried alarmed at the audacious request and the manner in which it was made this letter is certainly not for me and she tore it into fragments if the letter was not for you why have you torn it up said the girl i should have given it back to the person who sent it be good enough my dear said lizaveta disconcerted by this remark not to bring me any more letters for the future and tell the person who sent you that he ought to be ashamed but herman was not the man to be thus put off every day lizaveta received from him a letter sent now in this way now in that they were no longer translated from the german herman wrote them under the inspiration of passion and spoke in his own language and they bore full testimony to the inflexibility of his desire and the disordered condition of his uncontrollable imagination lizaveta no longer thought of sending them back to him she became intoxicated with them and began to reply to them and little by little her answers became longer and more affectionate at last she threw out of the window to him the following letter this evening is going to be a ball at the embassy the countess will be there we shall remain until two o'clock you have now an opportunity of seeing me alone as soon as the countess is gone the servants will very probably go out and there will be nobody left but the swiss but he usually goes to sleep in his lodge come about half-past eleven walk straight upstairs if you meet anybody in the ante-room ask if the countess is at home you will be told no in which case there will be nothing left for you to do but to go away again but it is most probable that you will meet nobody the maid-servants will all be together in one room on leaving the ante-room turn to the left and walk straight on until you reach the countess's bedroom in the bedroom behind a screen you will find two doors the one on the right leads to a cabinet which the countess never enters the one on the left leads to a corridor at the end of which is a little winding staircase this leads to my room herman trembled like a tiger as he waited for the appointed time to arrive at ten o'clock in the evening he was already in front of the countess's house the weather was terrible the wind blew with great violence the sleety snow fell in large flakes the lamps emitted a feeble light the street was deserted from time to time a sledge drawn by a sorry-looking hack passed by on the lookout for a belated passenger herman was enveloped in a thick overcoat and felt neither wind nor snow at last the countess's carriage drew up herman saw two footmen carry out in their arms the bent form of the old lady wrapped in sable fur and immediately behind her clad in a warm mantle and with her head ornamented with a wreath of fresh flowers followed lizaveta the door was closed the carriage rolled away heavily through the yielding snow the porter shut the screen door the windows became dark herman began walking up and down near the deserted house at length he stopped under a lamp and glanced at his watch it was twenty minutes past eleven he remained standing under the lamp his eyes fixed upon the watch impatiently waiting for the remaining minutes to pass at half-past eleven precisely herman ascended the steps of the house and made his way into the brightly illuminated vestibule the porter was not there herman hastily ascended the staircase opened the door of the ante-room and saw a footman sitting asleep in an antique chair by the side of a lamp with a light firm step herman passed by him the drawing-room and dining-room were in darkness but a feeble reflection penetrated thither from the lamp in the ante-room herman reached the countess's bedroom before a shrine which was full of old images a golden lamp was burning faded stuffed chairs and divans with soft cushions stood in melancholy symmetry around the room the walls of which were hung with china silk on one side of the room hung two portraits painted in paris by madame lebrun 
One of these represented a stout, red-faced man of about forty years of age, in a bright green uniform and with a star upon his breast. The other, a beautiful young woman, with an aquiline nose, forehead curls, and a rose in her powdered hair. In the corners stood porcelain shepherds and shepherdesses. Dining-room clocks from the workshop of the celebrated Lefroy, bandboxes, roulettes, fans, and the various playthings for the amusement of ladies that were in vogue at the end of the last century, when Montgolfier's balloons and Mesmer's magnetism were the rage. Herman stepped behind the screen. At the back of it stood a little iron bedstead. On the right was the door which led to the cabinet, on the left the other which led to the corridor. He opened the ladder and saw the little winding staircase which led to the room of the poor companion but he retraced his steps and entered the dark cabinet time passed slowly all was still the clock in the drawing-room struck twelve the strokes echoed through the room one after the other and everything was quiet again herman stood leaning against the cold stove he was calm his heart beat regularly like that of a man resolved upon a dangerous but inevitable undertaking one o'clock in the morning struck then two and he heard the distant noise of carriage wheels an involuntary agitation took possession of him the carriage drew near and stopped he heard the sound of the carriage steps being let down all was bustle within the house the servants were running hither and thither there was a confusion of voices and the rooms were lit up three antiquated chambermaids entered the room and they were shortly afterwards followed by the countess who more dead than alive sank into a voltaire armchair herman peeped through a chink lizaveta ivanova passed close by him and he heard her hurried steps as she hastened up the little spiral staircase for a moment his heart was assailed by something like a pricking of conscience but the emotion was only transitory and his heart became petrified as before the countess began to undress before her looking-glass her rose-bedecked cap was taken off and then her powdered wig was removed from her white and closely cut hair hairpins fell in showers around her her yellow satin dress brocaded with silver fell down at her swollen feet herman was a witness of the repugnant mysteries of her toilette at last the countess was in her nightcap and dressing-gown and in this costume more suitable to her age she appeared less hideous and deformed like all old people in general the countess suffered from sleeplessness having undressed she seated herself at the window in a voltaire armchair and dismissed her maids the candles were taken away and once more the room was left with only one lamp burning in it the countess sat there looking quite yellow mumbling with her flaccid lips and swaying to and fro her dull eyes expressed complete vacancy of mind and looking at her one would have thought that the rocking of her body was not a voluntary action of her own but was produced by the action of some concealed galvanic mechanism suddenly the death-like face assumed an inexplicable expression the lips ceased to tremble the eyes became animated before the countess stood an unknown man do not be alarmed for heaven's sake do not be alarmed said he in a low but distinct voice i have no intention of doing you any harm i have only come to ask a favour of you the old woman looked at him in silence as if she had not heard what he had said herman thought that she was deaf and bending down towards her ear he repeated what he had said the aged countess remained silent as before you can ensure the happiness of my life continued herman and it will cost you nothing i know that you can name three cards in order herman stopped the countess appeared now to understand what he wanted she seemed as if seeking for words to reply it was a joke she replied at last i assure you it was only a joke there's no joking about the matter replied herman angrily remember chaplitsky whom you helped to win the countess became visibly uneasy her features expressed strong emotion but they quickly resumed their firmer immobility can you not name me these three winning cards continued herman the countess remained silent herman continued for whom are you preserving your secret for your grandsons they are rich enough without it they do not know the worth of money your cards would be of no use to a spendthrift he who cannot preserve his paternal inheritance will die in want even though he had a demon at his service i am not a man of that sort i know the value of money your three cards will not be thrown away upon me come he paused and trembling awaited her reply the countess remained silent herman fell upon his knees if your heart has ever known the feeling of love said he if you remember its rapture if you have ever smiled at the cry of your newborn child if any human feeling has ever entered into your breast i entreat you by the feelings of a wife a lover a mother by all that is most sacred in life not to reject my prayer reveal to me your secret of what use is it to you maybe it is connected with some terrible sin with the loss of eternal salvation with some bargain with the devil reflect you are old you have not long to live i am ready to take your sins upon my soul only reveal to me your secret remember that the happiness of a man is in your hands that not only i but my children and grandchildren will bless your memory and reverence you as a saint the old countess answered not a word herman rose to his feet you old hag he explained grinding his teeth then i will make you answer and with these words he drew a pistol from his pocket 
at the sight of the pistol the countess for the second time exhibited strong emotion she shook her head and raised her hands as if to protect herself from the shot then she fell backwards and remained motionless come and into this childish nonsense said herman taking hold of her hand i ask you for the last time will you tell me the names of your three cards or will you not the countess made no reply herman perceived that she was dead end of the queen of spades by alexander pushkin part one chapter two of best russian short stories this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Best Russian Short Stories, edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin, Part 2. 4. Lizaveta Ivanovna was sitting in her room, still in her ball dress, lost in deep thought. On returning home she had hastily dismissed the chambermaid, who very reluctantly came forward to assist her, saying that she would undress herself, and with a trembling heart had gone up to her own room, expecting to find Herman there, but yet hoping not to find him. At the first glance she convinced herself that he was not there, and she thanked her fate for having prevented him keeping the appointment she sat down without undressing and began to recall to mind all the circumstances which in so short a time had carried her so far it was not three weeks since the time when she first saw the young officer from the window and yet she was already in correspondence with him and he had succeeded in inducing her to grant him a nocturnal interview she knew his name only through his having written it at the bottom of some letters she had never spoken to him had never heard his voice and had never heard him spoken of until that evening but strange to say that very evening at the ball tomsky being piqued with the young princess pauline n who contrary to her usual custom did not flirt with him wished to revenge himself by assuming an air of indifference he therefore engaged lizaveta ivanovna and danced an endless mazurka with her during the whole time he kept teasing her about her partiality for engineer officers he assured her that he knew far more than she imagined and some of his jests were so happily aimed that lizaveta thought several times that her secret was known to him from whom have you learned all this she asked smiling from a friend of a person very well known to you replied tomsky from a very distinguished man and who is this distinguished man his name is herman lizaveta made no reply but her hands and feet lost all sense of feeling this herman continued tomsky is a man of romantic personality he has the profile of a napoleon and the soul of a mephistopheles i believe that he has at least three crimes upon his conscience how pale you've become i have a headache but what did this herman or whatever his name is tell you herman is very much dissatisfied with his friend he says that in his place he would act very differently i even think that herman himself has designs upon you at least he listens very attentively to all that his friend has to say about you and where has he seen me in church perhaps or on the parade god alone knows where it may have been in your room while you were asleep for there's nothing that he three ladies approaching him with the question Ouble ou regret interrupted the conversation which had become so tantalizingly interesting to lizaveta the lady chosen by tomsky was the princess pauline herself she succeeded in effecting a reconciliation with him during the numerous turns of the dance after which he conducted her to a chair on returning to his place tomsky thought no more either of herman or lizaveta she longed to renew the interrupted conversation but the mazurka came to an end and shortly afterwards the old countess took her departure tomsky's words were nothing more than the customary small talk of the dance but they sank deep into the soul of the young dreamer the portrait sketched by tomsky coincided with the picture she had formed within her own mind and thanks to the latest romances the ordinary countenance of her admirer became invested with attributes capable of alarming her and fascinating her imagination at the same time she was now sitting with her bare arms crossed and with her head still adorned with flowers sunk upon her uncovered bosom suddenly the door opened and herman entered she shuddered where were you she asked in a terrified whisper in the old countess's bedroom replied herman i've just left her the countess is dead my god what do you say and i'm afraid added herman that i am the cause of her death lizaveta looked at him and tomsky's words found an echo in her soul this man has at least three crimes upon his conscience herman sat down by the window near her and related all that had happened lizaveta listened to him in terror so all these passionate letters those ardent desires this bold obstinate pursuit all this was not love money that was what his soul yearned for she could not satisfy his desire and make him happy the poor girl had been nothing but the blind tool of a robber of the murderer of her aged benefactress she wept bitter tears of agonized repentance herman gazed at her in silence his heart too was a prey to violent emotion but neither the tears of the poor girl 
nor the wonderful charm of her beauty enhanced by her grief could produce any impression upon his hardened soul he felt no pricking of conscience at the thought of the dead old woman one thing only grieved him the irreparable loss of the secret from which he had expected to obtain great wealth you are a monster said lizaveta at last i did not wish for her death replied herman my pistol was not loaded both remained silent the day began to dawn lizaveta extinguished her candle a pale light illumined her room she wiped her tear-stained eyes and raised them towards herman he was sitting near the window with his arm crossed and a fierce frown upon his forehead in this attitude he bore a striking resemblance to the portrait of napoleon this resemblance struck lizaveta even how shall i get you out of the house said she at last i thought of conducting you down the secret staircase but in that case it would be necessary to go through the countess's bedroom and i'm afraid tell me how to find this secret staircase i'll go alone lizaveta arose took from her drawer a key handed it to herman and gave him the necessary instructions herman pressed her cold limp hand kissed her bowed head and left the room he descended the winding staircase and once more entered the countess's bedroom the dead old lady sat as if petrified her face expressed profound tranquillity herman stopped before her and gazed long and earnestly at her as if he wished to convince himself of the terrible reality at last he entered the cabinet felt behind the tapestry for the door and then began to descend the dark staircase filled with strange emotions down this very staircase thought he perhaps coming from the very same room and at this very same hour sixty years ago there may have glided in an embroidered coat with his hair dressed a loiseau royal and pressing to his heart his three-cornered hat some young gallant who has long been mouldering in the grave but the heart of his aged mistress had only to-day ceased to beat at the bottom of this staircase herman found a door which he opened with a key and then traversed a corridor which conducted him into the street five three days after the fatal night at nine o'clock in the morning herman repaired to the convent of where the last honours were to be paid to the mortal remains of the old countess although feeling no remorse he could not altogether stifle the voice of conscience which said to him you are the murderer of an old woman in spite of his entertaining very little religious belief he was exceedingly superstitious and believing that the dead countess might exercise an evil influence on his life he resolved to be present at her obsequies in order to implore her pardon the church was full it was with difficulty that herman made his way through the crowd the coffin was placed upon a rich catafalque beneath a velvet baldachin the deceased countess lay within it with her hands crossed upon her breast with a lace cap upon her head and dressed in a white satin robe above the catafalque stood the members of the household the servants in black captains with armorial ribbons upon their shoulders and candles in their hands the relatives children grandchildren and great-grandchildren in deep mourning nobody wept tears would have been un affectation the countess was so old that her death could have surprised nobody and her relatives had long looked upon her as being out of the world a famous preacher pronounced the funeral sermon in simple and touching words he described the peaceful passing away of the righteous who would pass long years in calm preparation for a christian end the angel of death found her said the orator engaged in pious meditation and waiting for the midnight bridegroom the service concluded amidst profound silence the relatives went first to take farewell of the corpse then followed the numerous guests who had come to render the last homage to her who for so many years had been a participator in their frivolous amusements after these followed the members of the countess's household the last of these was an old woman of the same age as the deceased two young women led her forward by the hand she had not the strength enough to bow down to the ground she merely shed a few tears and kissed the cold hand of the mistress herman now resolved to approach the coffin he knelt down upon the cold stones and remained in that position for some minutes at last he arose as pale as the deceased countess herself he ascended the steps of the catafalque and bent over the corpse at that moment it seemed to him that the dead woman darted a mocking look at him and winked with one eye herman started back took a false step and fell to the ground several persons hurried forward and raised him up at that same moment lizaveta ivanovna was born fainting into the porch of the church this episode disturbed for some minutes the solemnity of the gloomy ceremony among the congregation arose a deep murmur and a tall thin chamberlain a near relative of the deceased whispered in the ear of an englishman who was standing near him that the young officer was a natural son of the countess to which the englishman coldly replied oh during the whole of that day herman was strangely excited repairing to an out-of-the-way restaurant to dine he drank a great deal of wine contrary to his usual custom in the hope of deadening his inward agitation but the wine only served to excite his imagination still more on returning home he threw himself upon his bed without undressing and fell into a deep sleep when he woke up it was already night and the moon was shining into the room 
he looked at his watch it was quarter to three sleep had left him he sat down upon his bed and thought of the funeral of the old countess at that moment somebody in the street looked in at his window and immediately passed on again herman paid no attention to this incident a few moments afterwards he heard the door of his ante-room open herman thought that it was his orderly drunk as usual returning from some nocturnal expedition but presently he heard footsteps that were unknown to him somebody was walking softly over the floor in slippers the door opened and a woman dressed in white entered the room herman mistook her for his old nurse and wondered what could bring her there at that hour of the night but the white woman glided rapidly across the room and stood before him and herman recognized the countess i have come to you against my wish she said in a firm voice but i have been ordered to grant your request three seven ace will win for you if played in succession but only on these conditions that you do not play more than one card in twenty-four hours and you never play again during the rest of your life i forgive you my death on condition that you marry my companion lizaveta ivanovna with these words she turned around very quietly walked with a shuffling gait towards the door and disappeared herman heard the street door open and shut and again he saw someone looking at him through the window for a long time herman could not recover himself he then rose up and entered the room his orderly was lying asleep upon the floor and he had much difficulty in waking him the orderly was drunk as usual and no information could be obtained from him the street door was locked herman returned to his room lit his candle and wrote down all the details of his vision six two fixed ideas can no more exist together in the moral world than two bodies can occupy one in the same place in the physical world three seven ace soon drove out of herman's mind the thought of the dead countess three seven ace were perpetually running through his head and continually being repeated by his lips if he saw a young girl he would say how slender she is quite like the three of hearts if anybody asked what is the time he would reply five minutes to seven every stout man that he saw reminded him of the ace three seven ace haunted him in his sleep and assumed all possible shapes the threes bloomed before in the forms of magnificent flowers the sevens were represented by gothic portals and the aces became transformed into gigantic spiders one thought alone occupied his whole mind to make a profitable use of the secret which he had purchased so dearly he thought of applying for a furlough so as to travel abroad he wanted to go to paris and tempt fortune in some of the public gambling houses that abounded there chance spared him all this trouble there was in moscow a society of rich gamesters presided over by the celebrated chekolinsky who had passed all his life at the card table and had massed millions accepting bills of exchange for his winnings and paying his losses in ready money his long experience secured for him the confidence of his companions and his open house his famous cook and his agreeable and fascinating manners gained for him the respect of the public he came to st petersburg the young men of the capital flocked to his rooms for getting balls for cards and preferring the emotions of faro to the seductions of flirting narumov conducted herman to chekolinsky's residence they passed through a suite of magnificent rooms filled with attentive domestics the place was crowded generals and privy councillors were playing at whist young men were lolling carelessly upon the velvet-covered sofas eating ices and smoking pipes in the drawing-room at the head of a long table around which were assembled about a score of players sat the master of the house keeping his bank he was a man of about sixty years of age of a very dignified appearance his head was covered with silvery white hair his full florid countenance expressed a good nature and his eyes twinkled with a perpetual smile narumov introduced herman to him chekolinsky shook him by the hand in a friendly manner requesting him not to stand on ceremony and then went on dealing the game occupied some time on the table lay more than thirty cards chekolinsky paused after each throw in order to give the players time to arrange their cards and note down their losses listened politely to their requests and more politely still put straight the corners of cards that some players hands had chanced to bend at last the game was finished chekolinsky shuffled the cards and prepared to deal again will you allow me to take a card said herman stretching out his hand from behind a stout gentleman who was punting chekolinsky smiled and bowed silently as a sign of acquiescence narumov laughingly congratulated herman on his abjuration of that abstention from cards which he had practised for so long a period and wished him a lucky beginning stake said herman writing some figures with a chalk on the back of his card how much asked the baker contracting the muscles of his eyes excuse me i cannot see quite clearly forty-seven thousand roubles replied herman at these words every head in the room turned suddenly around and all eyes were fixed on herman he's taken leave of his senses thought narumov allow me to inform you said chekolinsky with his eternal smile that you are playing very high nobody here has ever staked more than two hundred and seventy-five roubles at once very well replied herman but do you accept my card or not 
Chekolinsky bowed in token of consent. I only wish to observe, said he, that although I have the greatest confidence in my friends, I can only play against ready money. For my own part, I am quite convinced that your word is sufficient, but for the sake of the order of the game, and to facilitate the reckoning up, I must ask you to put the money on your card. Herman drew from his pocket a banknote and handed it to Chekolinsky, who, after examining it in a cursory manner, placed it on Herman's card. He began to deal. On the right a nine turned up, and on the left a three. I have won, said Herman, showing his card. A murmur of astonishment rose among the players. Chekolinsky frowned, but the smile quickly returned to his face. Do you wish me to settle with you, he said to Herman. If you please, replied the latter. Chekolinsky drew from his pocket a number of banknotes and paid at once. Herman took up his money and left the table. Naramov could not recover from his astonishment. Herman drank a glass of lemonade and returned home. The next evening he again repaired to Chekolinsky's. The host was dealing. Herman walked up to the table. The punters immediately made room for him. Chekolinsky greeted him with a gracious bow. Herman waited for the next deal, took a card and placed upon it his 47,000 rubles, together with his winnings of the previous evening. Chekolinsky began to deal. A knave turned up on the right, a seven on the left. Herman showed his seven. There was a general exclamation. Chekolinsky was evidently ill at ease, but he counted out the 94,000 rubles and handed them over to Herman, pocketed them in the coolest manner possible, and immediately left the house. The next evening Herman appeared again at the table. Everyone was expecting him. The generals and the privy councillors left their whist in order to watch such extraordinary play. The young officers quitted their sofas, and even the servants crowded into the room. All pressed around Herman. The other players left off punting, impatient to see how it would end. Herman stood at the table and prepared to play alone against the pale, but still smiling, Chekolinsky. Each opened a pack of cards. Chekolinsky shuffled. Herman took a card and covered it with a pile of banknotes. It was like a duel. Deep silence reigned around. Chekolinsky began to deal. His hands trembled. On the right, a queen turned up, and on the left, an ace. Ace has won, cried Herman, showing his card. Your queen has lost, said Chekolinsky politely. Herman started. Instead of an ace, there lay before him the queen of spades. He could not believe his eyes, nor could he understand how he had made such a mistake. At that moment, it seemed to him that the queen of spades smiled ironically and winked her eye at him. He was struck by her remarkable resemblance. The old countess, he exclaimed, seized with terror. Chekolinsky gathered up his winnings. For some time, Herman remained perfectly motionless. When at last he left the table, there was a general commotion in the room. Splendidly punted, said the players. Chekolinsky shuffled the cards afresh, and the game went on as usual. Herman went out of his mind, and is now confined in room number 17 of the Apokov Hospital. He never answers any questions, but he constantly mutters with usual rapidity, Three seven ace, three seven queen. Lizaveta Ivanovna has married a very amiable young man, a son of the former steward of the old countess. He is in the service of the state somewhere, and is in receipt of a good income. Lizaveta is also supporting a poor relative. Tomsky has been promoted to the rank of captain, and has become the husband of the princess Pauline. End of the Queen of Spades by Alexander Pushkin Part 2「Chapter Three of Best Russian Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nolophidian. Best Russian Short Stories. Edited and compiled by Thomas Seltzer. The Cloak by Nikolai Gogol. Part One. In the department of... But it is better not to mention the department. The touchiest things in the world are departments, regiments, courts of justice, in a word, all branches of public service. Each individual nowadays thinks all society insulted in his person. Quite recently, a complaint was received from a district chief of police in which he plainly demonstrated that all the imperial institutions were going to the dogs, and that the Tsar's sacred name was being taken in vain, and in proof he appended to the complaint a romance, in which the district chief of police is made to appear about once in every ten pages, and sometimes in a downright drunken condition. Therefore, in order to avoid all unpleasantness, it will be better to designate the department in question as a certain department. 
So, in a certain department, there was a certain official. Not a very notable one, it must be allowed. Short of stature, somewhat pockmarked, red-haired and mole-eyed, with a bald forehead, wrinkled cheeks, and a complexion of the kind known as sanguine. The St. Petersburg climate was responsible for this. As for his official rank, with us Russians, the rank comes first. He was what is called a perpetual titular counselor, over which, as is well known, some writers make merry and crack their jokes, obeying the praiseworthy custom of attacking those who cannot bite back. His family name was Bashmachkin. This name is evidently derived from Bashmak, Shu, but when, at what time, and in what manner is not known. His father and grandfather, and all the Bashmachkins, always wore boots, which were resold two or three times a year. His name was Akaki Akakievich. It may strike the reader as rather singular and far-fetched, but he may rest assured that it was by no means far-fetched, and that the circumstances were such that it would have been impossible to give him any other. This was how it came about. Akaki Akakievich was born, if my memory fails me not, in the evening on the 23rd of March. His mother, the wife of a government official, and a very fine woman, made all due arrangements for having the child baptized. She was lying on the bed opposite the door. On her right stood the godfather, Ivan Ivanovich Eroshkin, a most estimable man, who served as the head clerk of the Senate, and the godmother, Arina Semyonova Bielobrinchkova, the wife of an officer of the quarter, and a woman of rare virtues. They offered the mother her choice of three names, Mokia, Sosia, or that the child should be called after the martyr Kozdazat. No, said the good woman, all those names are poor. In order to please her, they opened the calendar at another place. Three more names appeared, Trifili, Dula, and Varakazi. This is awful, said the old woman. What names? I truly never heard the like. I might have put up with Varadat or Varuk, but not Trafilian Varakazi. They turned to another page and found Pasikaki and Vaktisi. Now I see, said the old woman, that it is plainly fate, and since such is the case, it will be better to name him after his father. His father's name was Akaki, so let the son's name be Akaki too. In this manner he became Akaki Akakievich. They christened the child, whereat he wept and made a grimace, as though he foresaw that he was to be a titular counsellor. In this manner did it all come about. We have mentioned it in order that the reader might see for himself that it was a case of necessity, and that it was utterly impossible to give him any other name. When and how he entered the department, and who appointed him, no one could remember. However much the directors and chiefs of all kinds were changed, he was always to be seen in the same place, the same attitude, the same occupation. Always the letter-copying clerk, so that it was afterwards affirmed that he had been born in uniform with a bald head. No respect was shown him in the department. The porter not only did not rise from his seat when he passed, but never even glanced at him, any more than if a fly had flown through the reception room. His superiors treated him in coolly despotic fashion. Some insignificant assistant to the head clerk would thrust a paper under his nose without so much as saying, Copy! or here's an interesting little case, or anything else agreeable, as is customary amongst well-bred officials. And he took it, looking only at the paper, 
and not observing who handed it to him, or whether he had the right to do so. He simply took it, and set about copying it. The young officials laughed at and made fun of him, so far as their official wit permitted, told in his presence various stories concocted about him, and about his landlady, an old woman of seventy, declared that she beat him, asked when the wedding was to be, and strewed bits of paper over his head, calling them snow. But Akaki Akakievich answered not a word, any more than if there had been no one there besides himself. It even had no effect upon his work. Amid these annoyances, he never made a single mistake in a letter. But if the joking became wholly unbearable, as when they jogged his head, and prevented his attending to his work, he would exclaim, Leave me alone! Why do you insult me? And there was something strange in the words and the voice in which they were uttered. There was in it something which moved to pity, so much so that one young man, a newcomer, who, taking pattern by the others, had permitted himself to make sport of Akaki, suddenly stopped short, as though all about him had undergone a transformation, and presented itself in a different aspect. Some unseen force repelled him from the comrades whose acquaintance he had made, on the supposition that they were decent, well-bred men. Long afterwards, in his gayest moments, there recurred to his mind the little official with the bald forehead, with his heart-rending words, "'Leave me alone!' Why do you insult me? In these moving words, other words resounded. I am thy brother. And the young man covered his face with his hand, and many a time afterwards, in the course of his life, shuddered at seeing how much inhumanity there is in man, how much savage coarseness is concealed beneath refined, cultured, worldly refinement, and even... O oh God, in that man whom the world acknowledges as honorable and upright. It would be difficult to find another man who lives so entirely for his duties. It is not enough to say that Akaki labored with zeal. No, he labored with love. In his copying he found a varied and agreeable employment. Enjoyment was written on his face. Some letters were even favorites with him, and when he encountered these he smiled, winked, and worked with his lips, till it seemed as though each letter might be read in his face, as his pen traced it. If his pay had been in proportion to his zeal, he would, perhaps to his great surprise, have been made even a counselor of state. But he worked, as his companions, the wits, put it, like a horse in a mill. However, it would be untrue to say that no attention was paid to him. One director, being a kindly man, and desirous of rewarding him for his long service, ordered him to be given something more important than mere copying. So he was ordered to make a report of an already concluded affair to another department, the duty consisting simply in changing the heading and altering a few words from the first to the third person. This caused him so much toil that he broke into a perspiration, rubbed his forehead, and finally said, No, give me rather something to copy. After that, they let him copy on forever. Outside this copying, it appeared that nothing existed for him. He gave no thought to his clothes. His uniform was not green, but a sort of rusty meal color. The collar was low, so that his neck, in spite of the fact that it was not long, seemed inordinately so as it emerged from it, like the necks of the plaster cats which peddlers carry about on their heads. And something was always sticking to his uniform, either a bit of hay or some trifle. Moreover, he had a peculiar knack, as he walked along the street, 
of arriving beneath the window just as all sorts of rubbish was being flung out of it. Hence he always bore about on his hat scraps of melon rinds and other such articles. Never once in his life did he give heed to what was going on every day to the street, while it is well known that his young brother officials trained the range of their glances till they could see when any one's trouser straps came a done upon the opposite sidewalk, which always brought a malicious smile to their faces. But Akaki Akakievich saw in all things the clean, even strokes of his written lines, and only when a horse thrust his nose from some unknown quarter over his shoulder and sent a whole gust of wind down his neck from his nostrils, did he observe that he was not in the middle of a line, but in the middle of the street. On reaching home, he sat down at once at the table, sipped his cabbage soup up quickly, and swallowed a bit of beef with onions, never noticing their taste, and gulping down everything with flies and anything else which the Lord happened to send at the moment. When he saw that his stomach was beginning to swell, he rose from the table and copied papers which he had brought home. If there happened to be none, he took copies for himself, for his own gratification, especially if the document was noteworthy, not on account of its style, but of its being addressed to some distinguished person. Even at the hour when the grey St. Petersburg sky had quite disappeared, and all the official world had eaten or dined, each as he could, in accordance with the salary he received and his own fancy. When all were resting from the department jar of pens, running to and fro, for their own and other people's indispensable occupations, and from all the work that an uneasy man makes willingly for himself, rather than what is necessary, when officials hasten to dedicate to pleasure the time which is left to them, one bolder than the rest going to the theatre, another into the street looking under the bonnets, another wasting his evening in compliments to some pretty girl, the star of a small official circle, another, and this is the common case of all, visiting his comrades on the third or fourth floor, in two small rooms with an anteroom or kitchen, and some pretensions to fashion, such as a lamp or some other trifle which has cost many a sacrifice of dinner or pleasure trip. In a word, at the hour when all officials disperse among the contracted quarters of their friends to play whist, as they sip their tea from glasses with a kopeck's worth of sugar, smoke long pipes, relate at times some bits of gossip, which a Russian man can never, under any circumstances, refrain from, and, when there is nothing else to talk of, repeat eternal anecdotes about the commandant to whom they had sent word that the tails of the horses on the falconet monument had been cut off. When all strive to divert themselves, Akaki Akakievich indulged in no kind of diversion. No one could even say that he had seen him at any kind of evening party. Having written to his heart's content, he lay down to sleep, smiling at the thought of the coming day, of what God might send him to copy on the morrow. Thus flowed on the peaceful life of the man, who, with a salary of four hundred roubles, understood how to be content with his lot, and thus it would have continued to flow on, perhaps to extreme old age, were it not that there are various ills strewn along the path of life for titular counsellors, as well as for private, actual, court, and every other species of counsellor, even to those who never give any advice or take any themselves. There exists in St. Petersburg a powerful foe of all who receive a salary of four hundred roubles a year, or thereabouts. This foe is no other than the northern cold, although it is said to be very healthy. At nine o'clock in the morning, at the very hour when the streets are filled with men bound for the various official departments, 
it begins to bestow such powerful and piercing nips on all noses impartially that the poor officials really do not know what to do with them at an hour when the foreheads of even those who occupy exalted positions ache with the cold and tears start to their eyes the poor titular councillors are sometimes quite unprotected their only salvation lies in traversing as quickly as possible in their thin little cloaks five or six streets and then warming their feet in the porter's room and so thawing all their talents and qualifications for official service which had become frozen on the way akaki akakievich had felt for some time that his back and shoulders were paining with peculiar poignancy in spite of the fact that he tried to traverse the distance with all possible speed he began finally to wonder whether the fault did not lie in his cloak he examined it thoroughly at home and discovered that in two places namely on the back and shoulders it had become thin as gauze the cloth was worn to such a degree that he could see through it and the lining had fallen into pieces you must know that akaki akakievich's cloak served as an object of ridicule to the officials 